When was the last time you went to the museum? Well, join me as we explore the Museum of Technology in the Capital Wasteland. The place may be overrun by super mutants, but many of the exhibits still exist, and we can still read the plaques. We are sent to the Museum of Technology by Three Dog from GNR. He needs us to grab the communications relay dish from the Virgo 2 lunar lander, which was on display in the museum when the bombs dropped. We find the Museum of Technology on the far southern end of the mall. It's hard to miss. It's a large building. It has traditional Fallout Art Deco faces adorning the exterior, and we see many Museum of Technology banners still hanging. Immediately upon entry, we enter a thick firefight. The lobby of this museum is swarming with super mutants. After they're dead, we can go ahead and take a look at some of the exhibits on display here. We see some helpful directions on the walls, pointing us to where we need to go. Okay, the Virgo 2 exhibit is going to be that way. But before we go, let's check out this plaque. Sadly, it doesn't look like anything is in this display case anymore. The glass is broken, but the plaque reads, Perhaps the most well-recognized weapon in the modern U.S. military arsenal, the M199 earned its nickname The Backtalker from the unusual report the firing mechanism makes as it ejects a spent shell. Firing standard 556mm rounds, the M199 is still the official infantry weapon of the U.S. Army. On loan from the International Ordnance Museum, these cases display the various types of weapons and ammunition used by the military in past conflicts all over the globe. This last one is just a general note about the various displays we're going to see in this entryway. But the M199 is a little bit confusing because it says here that the weapon is still the official infantry weapon of the U.S. Army. Well, if that was the case, then we should find a lot of these weapons all over the world. But we don't. This weapon isn't anywhere in the game. Instead, we find the R-91 assault rifle in Fallout 3. I suppose it's possible that the military decommissioned the M199 after this exhibit had already been put on and before the bombs dropped. Next to this display is another empty case, and the plaque reads, This is the only known prototype of the X-277 Viper magnetic rail cannon developed for the U.S. military by West Tech. Also commonly referred to as a rail gun, the weapon uses energy cells to propel a depleted uranium round across a series of magnets discharging it at extremely high velocity. Deemed too costly to produce on a mass scale, the project was abandoned in 2044. It's tragic that we don't find the weapon in the display case. I would love a sample. But the military stopped research, probably in favor of continuing research on the Gauss rifle. It's a similar technology, using magnetism to propel a metal slug. And the Gauss rifle was successful. We find the prototype after installing the Operation Anchorage DLC. The next empty display case reads, The Type 1861 Springfield Rifle Musket was the standard weapon for the infantry soldier of the American Civil War. It was a muzzle-loaded weapon which fired a 58 caliber mini-ball using percussion caps instead of the traditional flintlock. Almost a million of these weapons were manufactured for soldiers during the war. In the very middle of the lobby, we see a familiar sight. This looks like the Kitty Hawk, and the plaque nearby confirms it. The aircraft above is the original Wright Flyer 1 designed by Orville and Wilbur Wright. On December 17th, 1903, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the vehicle performed its maiden flight for a mere 12 seconds, covering a distance of only 120 feet. This historic event marked the first sustained and controlled heavier-than-air powered flight. It's sad to see such a historic plane in such a state of disrepair, but I suppose we should be grateful that at least it still exists. Heading on over to the northwestern corner of the room, we find our first terminal, the Research Leads Terminal. On it, we find five log entries. 
The first one by B. Bell, the research lead, says that the team finally localized and identified a computer virus that had infected their computer mainframe at the museum. After finding it, they effectively cleaned the entire system, and Bell ends by saying, the soul of this machine has been improved. Someone at Bethesda was a Fear Factory fan. This is a direct reference to a song by the band Fear Factory called Archetype, sung by Burton Bell. The chorus goes, The infection has been removed. The soul of this machine has been improved. It's no coincidence that the lead researcher was named B. Bell. In the next one, we learn that the Virgo 2 lunar lander was finally put on display after the research team pulled it out of storage and restoring it. As a thank you to so many team members who worked many sleepless nights on the project, B. Bell, the research lead, gave each member a substantial bonus in their next paychecks. Give each other a pat on the back, he says. You've earned it. Well, it's good to see a boss in the Fallout universe that isn't a complete jerk. In the next entry, we see a list of acquisitions that the museum had been awarded, presumably by the government. Before they could put any of these on display, one of the research members needed to be assigned to the project, so B. Bell asks his team for people to submit requests to work on a specific project. The four new acquisitions that had been awarded to the museum were the supersonic airliner, the Zax computer prototype, the original model for the T-45D suit of power armor, and the laser pistol prototype. Well, since these had just been awarded, looks like we won't find any of these in the museum. In the next one, B. Bell lodges a formal complaint regarding the firearms exhibit that we just saw at the entry to the museum. He says, With the world tensions the way they are right now, I feel it's highly inappropriate to glorify these killing devices by promoting them as a tourist attraction. If this is some sort of patriotic gesture, then it is entirely lost upon me, and I urge you to rethink this decision. Oh, I don't know. I don't see anything wrong with showing off guns as an exhibit. Though I must admit I'd be a little concerned to have working firearms in a room filled with children. In the final note, B. Bell complains about a malfunctioning planetarium projection system. He says that the automated system is prone to malfunctions at least once a week. Bell suggests that they get rid of the automated system and bring back the human element so the audience will feel more engaged. A member of his team has to intervene at least once a week anyway. Well, if the planetarium had an automated system, I wonder if it's still functional 200 years later. Out of the terminal and going to the southern side of the room, we find a Robco Stealth Boy still on display. It's a wonder this hasn't been taken over the past 200 years. This is a Robco Stealth Boy Model 3001, personal stealth device. Developed by Robert Mayflower, the Stealth Boy generates a modulating field that transmits the reflected light from one side of an object to the other, making the bearer almost invisible to the untrained eye. We know elsewhere from lore that even though this is attributed to Robert Mayflower, the United States likely developed the Stealth Boy technology after acquiring some Chinese stealth armor off of their enemy. They then reverse engineered the technology to develop the Stealth Boy. Going east along this wall, we find the next terminal. This is the Museum Information Terminal, and on it we find a guide to the museum. We learned that they had a bunch of transportation exhibits, but sadly, these were destroyed after the bombs dropped because this building is partially collapsed. The exhibit had steam-powered cars and talked about the development of the internal combustion engine. They had an exhibit on micro-sized nuclear power and had a walkthrough exhibit of a two-story Mach Fusion engine. This exhibit, incidentally, was sponsored by the Chrysler Corporation, which of course makes sense because they're the ones who are in charge of producing nuclear-powered vehicles. The next exhibit showed off the development of the Mr. Handy, Mr. Gutsy, and Protectron robotic lines. They also had an artificial intelligence game where kids could program a robot and watch it obey their commands in real time. The exhibit was sponsored by Robco and General Atomics, Robco for the Protectrons, and General Atomics for the Mr. Handys and Mr. Gutsies. The next exhibits were scattered throughout the Museum of Technology. These were the aircraft exhibits. We saw one of these already, the Kitty Hawk in this room. We'll see the other one mentioned in this terminal, the World War II era P-51 Mustang hanging from the ceiling later. They also had some flight simulations, 
but sadly these have been destroyed. The final one here talks about their space exhibit, where they talk about the Virgo 2 moon lander that participated in the first manned moon landing. They mention a G-Force simulator, which sadly was destroyed, but then they mention the Copernicus Planetarium, which still exists. We'll be able to check that out in a minute. Another exhibit they had is a vault tech exhibit. Thanks to the generous grant from the vault tech Corporation, the vault tour is open to the public. vault tech has been doing stuff like this all over the place because it's a great advertisement for their vaults. They did the same thing at Nuka World, generously providing the money to show off what a vault would look like on Mars. But of course, it was all just part of a sales scheme, as we learned from the terminals there, to sell vault spaces. It's likely they had the same strategy here. They had a power armor demo going on here, and we learned that West Tech is the name of the company that manufactured the T-51B suits of power armor. Sadly, this part of the building has since been destroyed. We won't find this display. It's interesting that it ends by saying, note that a liability waiver must be signed to attend this event. Sounds like people had a high risk of being injured during this display. This next one is ironic and sad. There was a lecture going on here by Professor R.J. Gumby titled Oppenheimer's Folly. Oppenheimer is, of course, Julius Robert Oppenheimer, who is one of the men often referred to as the father of the atomic bomb for his role in the Manhattan Project. It is he who quoted from the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, upon seeing the world's first nuclear detonation. This incidentally was quoted by Nick Valentine in Far Harbor, if you decide to blow up the nucleus. The lecture was called Oppenheimer's Folly because R.J. Gumby argued that a worldwide nuclear war may not be as far off as we think. By illustrating past uses of smaller-scale atomic weapons, Professor Gumby will shock you, frighten you, and make you wish you could just duck and cover to survive a real nuclear attack. They likely hyped up the fear factor for this lecture, trying to sell as many tickets as they could, without realizing how justified such fear should be. The next note is about the planetarium. They had four different shows at the planetarium. The Long Road to Mars, which took viewers on a simulated flight through the solar system from Earth to the Red Planet. Journey Beyond the Universe, which took people on a theoretical journey farther than anyone has gone before. We're All Just Stardust, which talks about the elements that makes up every human being and how they come from stars. And finally, the Zany Planet Show. This one was for kids between 4 and 10 years old. Join Captain Space Galaxy as he travels the solar system and visits each of the worlds within it. The final one talks about the Gigantomax Theater, which was destroyed when the bombs dropped. We don't find it here, but it tells us the shows that played here. The first was called Yikes. Cower in fear as all sorts of gigantic vehicles drive at the viewer and give you a bug's eye view of oncoming traffic. Wow, that must have been scintillating for the first five seconds. Roller coaster, strap yourself in for the ride of your life, all from the safety of our 300 seat Gigantomax Theater. Ride 10 of the world's most notorious roller coasters from the front seat. Sickness bags not included. And finally, my favorite, colonoscopy. Using our special Gigantomex technology, you'll marvel at the details on our three-story screen as you take a real-time voyage into a very familiar part <laughs> of the human anatomy. <laughs> now, that is one I would pay to see. The final entry is unusual. Pound zero zero zero. Hey there, Jigs. I finally found a good place to ditch your share of the loot. It was hell getting here, but I made it. I left the usual breadcrumbs all over some of the info terminals in this place. Their computer security was a joke. Complete the sequence and you're home free. But make any mistakes and the system will lock you out. We'll meet up in the usual spot later. Good luck, Prime. So, some scavenger has made their way into the Museum of Technology and hidden a treasure here. They placed a key to the location of the treasure scattered amongst all of the terminals here. We need to find the terminals that have the clues and piece the puzzle together. 
Through a double door right next to this terminal, we reach the bathrooms. There's nothing of interest in either bathroom, but we do find a door to an employees only section, which brings us upstairs past a whole bunch of blood splattered all over the walls. At the very top, we find an employee observation room. This overlooks one of the other exhibits. And from here, we can access a terminal, which has all of the same bulletins we read earlier. And we find a terminal where we can activate a turret. This would have been useful to clear out the super mutants had we known about it earlier. But alas, at least we know it for next time. To find the next exhibits, we go back down the stairs, head out of the bathroom area, and follow the signs pointing up the stairs towards the Virgo 2 exhibit. At the top of the stairs, we find a few more exhibits. One is about the USS Ibn Atoll's flag. This flag was recovered from the wreck of the USS Ibn Atoll, a US Navy missile cruiser, sunk off the coast of Alaska in 2066 with all hands lost. The cutting-edge vessel's loss was due to a nuclear torpedo strike from the U.S. Navy submarine, the USS Interference, during the Anchorage campaign. The submarine mistook the cruiser for an enemy vessel during radio silence and sunk it before obtaining visual confirmation. This ranks as one of the most tragic disasters in U.S. naval history since World War II. Oh, that's horrible. All those sailors dead. In the next one, we see four frames on a wall, but the portraits have long since rotted away. We learn a bit more about them from this nearby plaque. These portraits, created by the renowned contemporary artist Lincoln Myers, depict some of the more overlooked American inventors. From top to bottom, left to right, Richard Drew, who invented adhesive tape in 1925, James Riddy, who invented the cash register in 1879, Carl McGee, who invented the parking meter in 1935, and Mary Anderson, who invented the windshield wiper in 1903. Next to this display are two more terminals. We can activate them to see if we find part two of that secret message, but no, it's not on either of these terminals. Heading through this doorway, we see that it led to an exhibit called the Halls of Today, but the exhibit is completely caved in. On display in this hallway, however, are more Stealth Boys. The plaque has the exact same text as the one we read earlier, but here we can loot two of them. I'm not sure why they would have the same display twice. Heading back out, we can go across the balcony where we see that observation room we visited earlier, and then turn left following the arrows towards the vault tour. This is an audio tour that plays a message as we continue through the exhibit. Tech welcomes you to our new line of subterranean vaults featuring our patented Triple S technology. Triple S technology is Vault Tech's convergence of the three most important parts of apocalyptic endurance, safety, survivability, and sanitation. Heading through the door, we hear it buzzing an alarm, and we learn that it only has a 2% failure rate. Sleep in quiet comfort knowing that our impenetrable vault doors can withstand a direct hit by an atomic bomb with only a projected 2% failure rate. Heading through the door and down the steps, we learn more about how people coped with being underground. Being underground got you down? Smile! Our Simusun lighting mimics the feeling of being outside with only a fraction of the sunburn potential. Down the steps and around the corner, we see two observational windows. This exhibit doesn't automatically play. We have to interact with the button on the wall to start it. The living sections make use of our revolutionary floor suck auto cleaner system for those darned messy kids. Never sweep again. So are they saying that the vacuum cleaner was revolutionary? Or is this some other floor suck carpet cleaning system? At any rate, it's ironic that immediately after hearing him say never sweep again, we find the remains of presumably a janitor with a broom in his hands. Around the corner, we see the next exhibit to the left. Moms will love how our Culinator 3000 kitchen system makes cooking a breeze. Mmm, I can smell the muffins baking now. Past the kitchen, we see a movie projection room. Or don't be. Step into our Entertainatron room and watch the latest holotapes, or perhaps listen to a symphony. Another Vault Tech innovation. Are they calling projected slideshows an innovation? Seems a bit grandiose. The next one about security plays as we go up the stairs. Concerns about security? Our eye on you cameras enable the vault's leader to watch your every move. You'll never be alone again. They really put on the sales pitch as we start to leave. Should the unlikely event arise that the planet is laid to waste, you'll feel happy knowing your family will be safe in a vault tech vault. 
We hope you've enjoyed our tour today. If you have any further questions, please take a brochure from our helpful Vault Tech guides. You know, this museum was likely funded by the U.S. government. I wonder how much Vault Tech, a private company, had to pay the government to have essentially a huge advertisement inside the museum. The end of this exhibit lets us out on a balcony that leads to the door to the Museum of Technology West Wing. On the other side, we find ourselves on a balcony with two ways forward. We can go down some stairs or go left down a hallway. We're going to go left for now. Here we see a miniature vertebrate on display. The plaque says... This is a scaled model of a prototype military transport vehicle being developed by the U.S. military. The XVB02 Vertibird is a vertical takeoff and landing craft with an extremely durable armored fuselage and can be armed with a variety of offensive weapons and defensive countermeasures. This is the most advanced aircraft of its kind ever developed, and the military hopes to press them into service by 2085. So the information they were giving to the public was not exactly accurate. We saw vertebrates in use while we were rushing to the vault at the very beginning of Fallout 4. So the military did have these in 2077, almost 10 years before the projected service date on this plaque. We may be able to explain this by saying that the military accelerated the development of the vertebrate in response to Chinese communist threat after this display already went up at the Museum of Technology. On this level, we find two more museum information terminals. The first one has all the same entries in it, but the second one has pound 002. Oh, that's interesting. Where was 001? The first one we found was 000. I wonder if we missed one somewhere. We find four choices with the word good luck. 24, 38, 53, or 88. Well, we have one chance to do this, but we weren't given any directions, which is the correct option. The secret may be in the name of the person who left the note to begin with. His name was Prime. Of these four options, there is only one number that's a Prime number, and that number is 53. Clicking 53 brings us back to the original menu where we see 002 confirmed. All right, looks like we chose correctly. Now to find the rest of the terminals. Heading down the nearby hallway, we see that we're going the long way around. The Virgo 2 exhibit is behind us, must be down those stairs we passed. We're headed towards the Delta 9 exhibit, but I want to explore the whole thing, so let's go ahead and go this way. Going through the door brings us to the top of a stairwell overlooking a giant rocket in the middle of the room. This room is guarded by a whole bunch of super mutants. We can then take our time going around and killing each one. Now that they're dead, we can go back to the door where we came in to look at each of the exhibits we passed along the way. In the hallway close to the door is an exhibit under construction sign. This exhibit is undergoing renovations and should return soon. Aw, no good lore there. But we've got a whole lot in here to explore. The Delta 9 rocket stands tall in the center of the room. There's a maintenance hatch open at the very tip of the rocket, and we can see its inner workings. Let's go downstairs to continue our exploration. In one of the display cases, we find something. The upper torso of a human being. Seems like all of the weapons have long since been looted, but this body remains. But what is a human body doing in a display case in a museum? The nearby plaque answers the question. It's called Captain Carl Bell. This is the actual skeleton of Captain Carl Bell who died on May 5th, 1961 after his space capsule crash landed. Captain Bell is credited as being the first human in space on board the space capsule Defiant 7, but this has been constantly refuted by both the Soviet Union and China. Defiant 7's flight lasted for a total of 12 minutes and 7 seconds, and it achieved one full revolution around the Earth. The corpse was donated by Edwina Bell. This is really disturbing! Whatever happened to respect for the dead? If I was an astronaut, and I knew that if I ever achieved anything, my body would be on public display in a museum, I would seriously regret my life choices. Poor Captain Carl Bell. 
On the northern side, we see a flag inside one of these display cases. This is the Valiant 12 flag. This unusual flag was recovered from the surface of the moon by the very last manned flight to its surface in 2052. The flag is from the old Valiant 12 Virgo 3 lunar lander that touched down November 14th 1969. Its remarkable condition can be attributed to its construction. The flag was actually made of special materials to withstand the harsh environments of space. East of this display is the next terminal, and lo and behold, we find number three at the very bottom. Here we have four numbers just like the last, 99, 105, 111, and 113. Now remember, we're not looking for odd numbers, because if we were, we would be stuck. We're looking for prime numbers. The only one of this list that is a prime is 113. After selecting the correct number, it says 003 confirmed, but I get the impression that there's at least one more to find. Continuing around the room, we find another display, this one called Spacesuit. This is the actual USSA deep space suit worn by Captain Carl Bell on May 5th, 1961. It then goes on to repeat the same information we read on the plaque near his corpse. Sadly, the spacesuit is gone. We don't get to loot it. Heading upstairs, we can examine each of these terminals and they all say the same thing about the Delta 9 rocket. The Delta 9 rocket, commissioned by the USSA in 2020, was the last of the manned rockets that sent out our brave American astronauts to the moon. The Delta 9 was in use for almost 15 years before being converted for military use and having the crew and instrument sections replaced with a nuclear warhead. The Delta 9 recorded over 77 successful launches, making it one of the most successful rockets in U.S. history. The rocket, developed entirely by U.S. USSA scientists was a single-stage vehicle with an ejectable crew section or satellite storage bay. The propulsion system was a nuclear electric derivative drive using a massive electrical jolt to start the nuclear reaction on launch. The crew section was protected from the radioactive chambers by way of a massive titanium vanadium disc. The spacecraft had the capability to sustain two astronauts for up to 24 days maximum. The longest recorded spaceflight in a Delta IX rocket was the 17-day Zeus-12 mission to the moon. 17 days? What on earth happened? In our universe, the Apollo 11 mission to the moon only lasted eight days and three hours. In the Fallout universe, why did the Zeus-12 mission last so long? Maybe they performed other experiments or... Maybe this whole mission was cover for a military operation. Perhaps they spent eight days doing science and the rest of the time doing espionage or sabotage. I guess we'll never know. The rest of the options control lights at the very top of this room. We can program the lights to shine on specific portions of the Delta 9 rocket. The plaque nearby these terminals tells us that the Delta 9 rocket was donated by the USSA and from a grant from the United States Department of Antiquities. We can examine each of these terminals as we wind our way up and around the room, but none of these terminals have the final clue. At the top of the staircase is a locked door that leads to a supply closet. There's a stairway going down, but this leads us to another room that we're about to enter. So let's go the long way, heading back out and going down the staircase all the way around to the very bottom of the Delta 9 room. We can leave out a hallway near the moon flag and take it all the way around until we reach another large room. This room is filled with super mutant masters and overlords, and it proves to be the most difficult fight of the entire building. After the dust settles, we can finally explore this room. And oh no! In the course of the battle, we knocked off the Mustang that was hanging from the ceiling. Ah, oh, poor Mustang, it lasted 200 years until we entered. 
First, let's check this information terminal, but no, at the bottom we don't see the next clue. So we can explore the rest of these exhibits. We find a case that used to have World War II medals. The medals in this case were typically awarded to American pilots in World War II. From left to right, top row to bottom, Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross, the Navy Cross, Air Medal, Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart. And of course, the primary display is the Virgo 2 Lunar Lander. On July 16th, 1969, the Virgo 2 Lunar Lander, Valiant 11, became the very first manned space vehicle to touch down on the moon. The Valiant 11's crew consisted of Captain Richard Wade, Captain Mark Garris, and Captain Michael Hagen of the USSA. We salute these brave and noble men who took the very first steps on a planetary body other than our own. Like they did with the original flag, the USSA must have gone back to the moon decades later to retrieve the Virgo 2 and bring it back to Earth to put on display. Seems like a monumental cost of fuel to go to the moon just to retrieve stuff they left behind decades earlier. If we have Three Dogs Quest, we can take the Virgo 2 dish and then continue exploring. Heading up the stairs to the balcony level of this room, we find a door that leads to a maintenance room. Inside the desk is the custodian key for Tech Museum, and the terminal has four bulletins. These notes were written by Derek Remings, the maintenance coordinator, and in the first one we learn again about how the automated system for the planetarium is malfunctioning. This was an intramail to other museum employees, telling them to alert Derek if they see the system malfunctioning again. In the next one we learn that their Gigantomax theater's sound system was so loud that they received a number of complaints and one pending lawsuit. Remember, this is the theater that had the fascinating colonoscopy experience. In response, they lowered the decibels from 130 to 120. Derek ends by saying, please note that all employees working in or near the theater should still wear proper ear protection to prevent any permanent damage. So he cares about his employees, but not the people in the theater. The threshold for getting permanent hearing damage is only 85 decibels. So even after making this change, these guys are deafening people who come to the Gigantomax to watch videos. What is wrong with them? In the next one, we learned that men haven't been flushing the toilets right. Due to this issue, Derek initiated a card swipe access system for each stall in the men's restroom. The system will log the name of the person using the stall and the time the stall was used, and most disturbingly, the contents of the ball. Ah, <laughs> until such time that we deem it no longer necessary. Why didn't they need to know what was in the ball? Can't some things just remain a mystery. In the final one, we learned that the vault Tech Vault Tour was consuming so much electricity that they had to install three new nuclear reactors in the basement of this building. Before the installation, they were experiencing blackouts and brownouts. Heading upstairs leads to that same supply closet that attaches to the Delta 9 room we explored earlier. With that, we can retrace our steps through the Virgo 2 room and down a hallway where we find a door to the left. At the top of the stairs, we find another door to another observation room. The terminal on the wall here is just a tur control terminal. Again, something I wish I would have known before I already cleared the super mutants out of the Virgo 2 room. And at the end of this room, we find a wall safe that requires a key and the Museum of Tech security terminal. After hacking this terminal, we see three security bulletins. In the first one, we learn that the weapons that we saw at the very beginning of the tour were donated by the International Ordnance Museum. They plan to have these weapons on display until December of 2077, and at least they recognize the potential danger of having these weapons on display by having extra security present at all times. This was written by Donald Cohen, the lead museum curator, and he continues in the second terminal entry, where he tells us that they moved all riot gear and firearms to a new gun locker in the planetarium research office. The key to this cabinet is held by the duty shift supervisor. In the last entry, we learned that the museum held an annual gala dinner where they expected over 100 attendees, including a lot of local dignitaries and heads of state. This dinner, of course, never happened since the bombs dropped before November. At the very end, we see number 000, but when we activate it, we get the message, 
find info terminals. All right, we must have missed one. We'll continue exploring and then retrace our steps to see if we can find the next info terminal. Back down the stairway and continuing down the hall, we turn the corner to enter the planetarium. The automated demonstration starts, but as soon as it does, we get attacked by super mutants. With the super mutants dead, let's try listening to this performance again. For as long as history has been recorded, man has had an insatiable hunger for knowledge regarding the universe. To understand why man is so interested in this unknown expanse of space around our little world, we must take a journey. Please, sit back, relax, and free yourself from the bonds of our planet as we take off for the stars. Star. Planet as we take stars. Stars. <laughs> As it was 200 years ago, the automated exhibit is still glitched. And do you recognize that voice? The voice actor was using his best Carl Sagan voice. Carl Sagan, of course, is a famous scientist that produced a lot of documentaries about space back in the day. He had a very distinctive speaking style. Despite how fascinating this planetarium is, it can get annoying to listen to the same thing over and over again. We can turn this off by heading up to a terminal on one of the platforms overlooking the planetarium where we can stop the show in progress. We find a door against the eastern wall, which leads to a maintenance room. And here's the gun cabinet, but it's still locked with a hard lock. After picking it, we find a bunch of ammunition, some assault rifles, a missile launcher, some missiles, and two pulse grenades. There's a Nuka-Cola Quantum on a shelf above the desk, and the terminal has all of the same log entries that we read on the previous maintenance terminal. Against the other wall is another terminal. We have to hack this, but the only option we find is an option to unlock the planetarium exit. If we try it, we get the message error, could not locate door to unlock. This terminal must have controlled a door that has since been covered in rubble or something. Heading out the way the super mutants came in leads us to a big room with a Mustang and a bunch of rubble blocking a hallway. On the eastern side, we find a terminal on a desk, far out space facts. Fact number one, the planet Jupiter is larger than 1,000 Earths. Number two, the outer layers of the sun have what's known as differential rotation. The equator of the surface rotates once every 25.4 days, but near the poles it rotates once every 36 days. Oh, fascinating. Number three. A neutron star is completely dense and solid matter. In fact, it weighs a trillion times heavier than lead. That means a piece of a neutron star the size of a pinhead would weigh as much as a large building. Number four. The sun loses almost 4 million tons of mass every second by turning hydrogen gas into energy. That adds up to almost 345 billion tons per day. Number five. If we were to send a message to someone on a planet belonging to our closest neighboring solar system, Alpha Centauri, which is almost 4.4 light years away, we wouldn't receive a reply message for 8.8 .8 years. Number six. There are about 175 billion galaxies in the observable universe, each with as few as 10 million stars, up to giants with 1 trillion stars, all orbiting a common center of mass. Number 7. If all of the particles that make up Saturn's rings were gathered together, they would form a sphere about 120 miles in diameter. Well, that's interesting. And number 8. Olympus Mons, a volcano found on Mars, is the largest known volcano in the solar system. It is 370 miles or 595 kilometers across and rises 15 miles, 24 kilometers. That's three times taller than Mount Everest. All right, now that we've got our space facts of the day, we can check out the other terminals, which all have the same space facts on them, so never mind. But we don't find that extra clue. Oh, we must have missed a terminal somewhere. Where is the other clue? Going up the stairs leads us back to that platform where we saw the vertebrate display and clue number two. The clue I missed is right back at the beginning in the room with Kitty Hawk. 
After accessing the first message, 000, it must have changed to 001. I expected to find the first clue on another terminal. I didn't expect it to immediately appear on the terminal where I found Prime's first note. Here, like the others, we find four numbers, but the only one of these which is Prime is number 19. With that, we get a new option at the very bottom that says Get Passcode. Nice job, Jigs. I knew you'd remember the good old days. The loot is in the security office, safe in the upper part of the West Wing. Use the terminal up there to get in. Enjoy your share, pal. You earned it. Meet me in the old diner outside the Jury Street Metro Station. See you there. Good luck, Prime. With that, we can head back and go up the stairs to the second observation room. With the key in hand, we can access the terminal and then select the last option to unlock the safe. Inside, we find a stash of 200 caps, some buff out, and the gun locker key. Well, we already unlocked it, so no need for this. And that completes the Museum of Technology. But I wonder, Prime told Jiggs to meet him at a diner by the Jury Street Metro Station. I wonder if he left something there. We do indeed find a diner. Heading inside and going behind the counter, we find the mangled remains of Prime. And on his body is the true reward. We find 500 caps, a bunch of chems, and the Zhao Long assault rifle. This is the most powerful assault rifle that uses 5.56mm ammunition in the entire game. It has the same AP cost, spread, and critical multiplier as other assault rifles, but it has the low durability as a Chinese assault rifle, making it fragile. It does one more damage than a Chinese assault rifle, bringing the DPS up to 96, making it a pretty decent gun for commando builds. And that is the full story of the Museum of Technology, Prime, and his friend Jigs. It's a great little location, jam-packed with all sorts of pre-war lore. What are your thoughts on the Museum of Technology? And what do you think of the major historical differences between the Fallout universe and our own due to the divergence? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.